got an opportunity tonight to, in the middle of our week, hit the pause button and kind of slow down a little bit in the middle of the busyness, maybe the monotony, maybe the routine, maybe you're kind of on autopilot because life can be that way sometimes. But let's slow down and let's open our hearts and let's say, God, go ahead and speak to us by your Holy Spirit. Give us some truth. Maybe challenge us, inspire us. Let's do that as a family. But we, we've got to pray and we've got to ask the Holy Spirit to come and help us. Will you do that with me? Lord Jesus, we come before you. We bow our hearts. We bow our lives. You're our master teacher. You're the one we're looking to for answers, for guidance. You're the one we're looking to to lift our heads, to challenge us, inspire us, God. I, I pray that you bring clarity to people's hearts, truth to people's hearts, God, and encourage us deep down in the core of who we are, Father, to become better people tonight that are called by your name and made in your image, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. You can grab your seat. And if you've got a Bible or an electronic device, go ahead and turn to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 13. We're going to be there for a couple minutes as we get started tonight. I'm super happy to be in church tonight. I don't know if you are. Uh, just grateful to have a church family, honestly. Uh, I think it's something that maybe sometimes we could take for granted, but I'm so grateful for you guys. Whether or not you're grateful for me, that's okay. I'm still grateful for you, and it's good to be in church with you. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5, we can read together. Paul says to the Corinthian church, he says this, Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Or, you do, or do you not realize this about yourself, that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you fail to meet the test. I hope you will find out that we have not failed the test. But we pray to God that you may not do wrong. Not that we may appear to have met the test, but that you may do what is right, though we may seem to have failed. For we cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the truth. For we are glad when we are weak and you are strong. Your restoration is what we pray for. Paul here, in speaking to the Corinthian church, is being sort of called out onto the carpet in a way by some people there in the church. And they want to know if Christ is really genuinely working in the Apostle Paul as he claims that he is. And Paul, being who he is, turns the tables on the Corinthian church and says, okay, if you want to test me, why don't you first of all examine yourself, test yourself, and we'll all take the test together, shall we? And his heart, if you could read through the kind of cryptic language there, is not that uh, he would prove that they're a failure or that he would prove himself right. His heart is that they would grow. His heart was, would be that they would pass the test, even if they perceive that he's failed the test. But he flips the tables on them and he says, why don't you examine yourselves? Why don't you test yourselves? Take a bit of a self-test. And that's what we're going to do tonight. You should have gotten your self-test on the way in or found it at your seat. It's this little card. And if any of you know me, you're thinking it would be Garrett who bring the college guy, the guy that's involved in Cottonwood College to bring a test into Wednesday night Bible study. Well, yep, I did it. It's, it's very fitting, isn't it? And I don't know how you feel about tests. I don't know how you feel about school. I don't know how you feel about college. The idea of taking a test can carry uh, some baggage. It can make us a little nervous sometimes. I was thinking back to my uh, high school days, my not so Christ-like days in high school. And I had this friend and there was this test coming up in a class and it was a big test and he decided he was going to cheat on the test. I never cheated on any tests, but he decided he was going to cheat. That's, that may or may not be true, but he decided that he was going to cheat on this test. And so he had this brilliant, in parentheses, really dumb idea to print the answers. Or he wrote them in a Word document, and he shrunk the font size down to about 
5.2. He printed out this little tiny piece of paper with all the answers to the test and taped it around his pencil. And I'm thinking, the amount of work and effort that went into that, I mean, what a great idea, but you could have just studied for the test, man. This test that Paul is talking about, this idea of examining ourselves, testing ourselves, is not a test that we should be anxious about, afraid of. It's not something that we should be stressed out about. You don't have to cheat on the test today. Let me just say that from the start as we take this test together. Now, a couple things to point, that, point out then right off the, the bat here. The test we're going to take is not the final exam. Okay? It's not the test that's going to determine your grade as a Christian. Here's the good news. Jesus Christ already got an A for us. And he translated that A onto our report card. And we get an A plus because of his grace. He transfers that to us. So that's not what this test is about. It's not the final exam. And this test is meant to help us grow. That's Paul's heart in even making this statement that he makes to the Corinthian church. The test is not meant to be a permanent uh, you know, marker of our failure or a label on us that should make us insecure about our faith. It's actually meant to grow and mature our faith. Paul makes it clear then that there are actually two main goals for this self-test, as he suggests. And that is, number one, to measure your faith in Christ who dwells in you. He says in verse 1, if you look, after he says, examine your faith, examine yourselves to see whether you're in the faith, test yourselves. Then he asks a question, which is probably at the heart of what this self-test is about tonight. He says, do you not realize that Christ dwells within you? He asks that question. And so we're measuring our faith in Christ who already is dwelling in us. And the end result, number two, the end result is that we would become more mature in our faith. And I know that because in verse 9, Paul says, For we are glad when we are weak and you are strong. Your restoration, he says to them, is what we're praying for. Restoration of what? Restoration of Christ-like maturity. Other translations say bring to completion or to make mature. The restoration that Paul is praying for as they all take this test together and examine themselves is that they would grow. That would, they would become more like Jesus. And the proof of the test tonight is actually not on this card that you're going to fill out. The, the ultimate proof of our test is what our life looks like, how we behave and how we conduct ourselves but that test, the test that Paul's talking about, the test of our faith starts from the inside. It, it requires us to, for a moment and from time to time, to look inward at our heart and at our soul and pay attention, hence the slowing down tonight, as to what's going on inside of us. And so I designed a self-test. And I designed the test with four questions that we're going to walk through together. And we're going to pause after a little bit of unpacking of each question and what is meant by that in the biblical context for that. And you're going to answer the question as best you can. You don't have to cheat on the test because this is not the final exam. Remember that, okay? So you only get out of the test however much you're willing to put in it by way of honesty and transparency before God, right? Right? How many, like, are so excited to take a test in church? Are you, like, as excited as me? Because it doesn't feel like it yet. No, it's okay. <laughs> Here's the first question. Here it is. What's holding you? What's holding you? Not what's holding you back. Not what's holding you captive. What's holding your life together? Or what's holding you like a father would hold his children? What's holding you? Or what helps you keep it together? How many feel like sometimes they just need to find a way to keep it together? What helps you keep it together? I like date nights with my wife. I like chocolate. 
chocolate chip cookies. I like a good movie, maybe listening to some good music. Crazy enough, I like a ridiculously rigorous workout for whatever reason that's really good for my soul. I like that stuff. And there's nothing wrong with those things that I like, but they can't keep my life together, can they? Those things can't keep my life together. What's holding you? You've got to, we've got to ask this question. The one who is truly held by the Father in every circumstance of life, whether good or bad, will agree with the psalmist who said in Psalm 91, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God. In Him I will trust. We usually see for the most part, that God, <clears throat> that we should in our lives run to God during every circumstance in our, in our life, particularly in those rough circumstances. I think what we fail to see oftentimes is how much God actually loves and desires for us to come to him. In the Old Testament, God called his chosen people, the nation of Israel, his special treasure, his holy nation, his kingdom of priests. And when they would sway away and worship other gods and not follow the law, the covenant law that he gave to them, he would make certain comments to them through the prophets of old. And some of his comments would sound something like this, I'm jealous over your affections. I am jealous. Jealous. What does it mean that God's a jealous God? What it means is that He longs for each one of us personally to run to Him on a regular basis and declare what the psalmist said in Psalm 91 You are my refuge, you are my fortress, in you I will trust. He longs for that more than we could possibly. Imagine if you have children, you know what it's like when your child comes running to you for help with their arms up. There's something in you that just responds and longs to see that. You would hate to see them running after other people or other things instead of you. How much stronger is the longing and love of God to have us run to him and find refuge and safety and rest and trust in him. I was remembering back uh, when I was a teenager and probably about 14, 13, 14 years old, I was out gallivanting around uh, with some friends of mine and we went into a store called um, Warehouse Music. You ever heard of this? It, it was like back when dinosaurs roamed the earth and if you wanted to buy music, you had to go get in your car and drive to a store and buy something really weird called a CD, a compact disc. And it was state-of-the-art, unbelievably technologically savvy because it wasn't a cassette tape. You could now buy a, a CD, and everybody had CDs, and if you had cassettes... Something was wrong with you. You weren't cool. You needed to get with the times. And warehouse music was one of the hot spots to get the CDs that you want. Come on, somebody. Let's go to warehouse music. Sorry, you can't. They shut it down. Anyway, we were there as 13, 14 year old kids, and my friend decided that he was going to steal a CD. I don't know why. The people I hung out with when I was a teenager, cheating and stealing, right? So he decides he's going to cheat, uh, uh, steal a CD, and he steals a CD, and he goes ahead and gets caught stealing a CD. And so they've got him in the back, and I'm like, oh, my gosh. I'm waiting outside like, what a fool. Why did he do this? And uh, they're telling me, well, we've got to call his mom. His mom has to come pick him up. So they, I think they wanted to scare him, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is going to be good. I can't wait to see the look on his mom's face when she shows up. And I never forget what happened when she got there. She was actually crying. She was just bawling her eyes out. And she saw him and she went and ran and hugged him. And she looked him in the eye and she said, why would you steal a CD? All you have to do is ask. 
you know, ask me for the 10 bucks or the eight bucks, whatever it was back in 1994, I don't know, to buy the CD. If you just ask me for it, I'll give it to you and you can go buy the CD. You don't have to run and do this with your life. Just come to me and I will give you what you need. And she, it was the complete opposite reaction that I thought she was going to have. And I feel like God looks down on our lives at the things that we look to to keep us together. And he's just scratching his head going, I don't understand this. Do you really think that's going to hold you? Do you really think that's a firm foundation? Do you really think that's going to help you keep it together? And if we're going to examine ourselves, if we're going to see if we're really in the faith, if we're going to test ourselves, I think we need to ask the question, what is holding you? Take a moment, pull out your card, get a pen out. Should be one on the seat back in front of you. I want you to answer the question as best you can. What is holding you? I put a few things on there that might be holding you. You can write something in in the other line if you would like to do that. Take a minute and do that. This is just between you and God. Now, for every one of our questions tonight, I want to propose something that I'm going to call an antidote. And it's an antidote because really what we're doing when we're taking this self-test is not trying to find out if we have a faith in Christ. What we're trying to do is test the purity of our faith because it gets diluted and it gets toxins in it. And there is an antidote that I want to propose for each one of these sections, each one of these questions that will counteract the toxins that are trying to dilute and poison our faith. And it just so happens that the antidote for every single one of our questions and problems is actually Jesus Christ. But I want to get more specific than that and bring in a part of who Christ is that speaks to the question or that speaks to the problem that the question raises. And for this particular question, the antidote is Christ's strength. Christ's strength. In Hebrews chapter 12, Hebrews chapter 12, you could turn there if you want. It says in verse 1, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. The writer of Hebrews says, look, in your day-to-day -day Christianity, in your day-to-day -day living as a human being, you need to look constantly, look and gaze upon the one who stared death in the face and endured the cross and everything that came with it, despised the shame because of the joy that was set before him. There was a strength in him put there by the Father. Now, remember Paul's, Paul's question in 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 13. He says, examine yourself, test yourself. Do you not know that Christ dwells in you? That strength that was in Jesus that got him to look death in the face, to see the cross, to see the torturing that was coming, to see everything that was coming his way by way of pain and walk straight into it. That strength is now inside you. And your, here, here's what we got to see. Our life is held together from the inside out, not from the outside in. That was better than that. Than the response. Maybe it was. I don't know. Our life is held together from the inside out, not from the outside in. Do you know what I mean by that? Our circumstances, things that we think need to adjust or get just right on the outside in order to help us keep it together, that's not how, how it's going to work. 
The way it's going to work is that Christ's strength that is in us, put there by the Holy Spirit, we have access to this strength by the right, what, doing what the writer of Hebrews says, which is look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who was full of strength as he looked in the face of death. Second question is this. What's pushing you? What's pushing you? What is your general motivation in life to do what you do and be who you are? What is sort of moving you from one thing to the next? What's pushing you? You ever seen those things at the airport? Uh, they're called, I learned today, they're called travelators. It's a cool word. <laughs> travelators, you know what I'm talking about? It's like a flat escalator. And you get on these things and it's like... And you just check out. You eat your, you drink your, air, your, your airport coffee, your airport food. You get on your phone and all of a sudden you can go 50 yards and you don't have to move at all. And you just, you just get sort of pushed from uh, place to place in the airport. And if we're not careful, uh, there are things in our life, there are relationships, there are our context and culture, there are ideas that can pick us up and sort of carry us along and push us from one thing to the next like a travelator. <laughs> And if we're going to examine ourselves and test ourselves, we can't check out on the travelator of life. We've actually got to do a check up and be intentional about understanding what might be pushing us in life, what might be our general motivating factors in life. And this can mean slowing down and paying attention. Slowing down. <laughs> Am I making this decision out of fear? Am I doing this out of emotional impulse? What are my motives? You slow down. You stop living impulsively. Stop living on a whim. Stop making a decision just because you feel a certain way in a certain moment, right? You slow down. My wife who's with me tonight she went on a journey several years ago of becoming an RN. And she started prospecting to get a job. And there was this, there was this little bit of a temptation and a push for her to find the biggest hospital that pay her the most money, give her the most lucrative career. When she went into becoming a nurse as a calling from God to begin with, not to find the most lucrative career, but there was this little push where all of a sudden what could push her life in one direction or another had to do with something other than God's will for her life. I think about my educational journey. I've been in school now for a gazillion years, and there's no end in sight. <laughs> but it's by choice. I'm, I'm a bit of a glutton for education. But God has continually dealt with me about this underlying thing in me that can pursue education to prove something. Prove something to myself, prove something to people that I can achieve, that I can have progress, that I can have an identity maybe. Maybe it's pride, maybe it's ego. Not, nevertheless, it's something in me that can be just sort of pushing me along, pushing me along. And I've got to stop and ask the question, what's pushing me? Sometimes what's pushing us is pain, or insecurity, or confusion. Several years ago, I was coming out of what I can only describe as a toxic relationship. And the only way I can describe what I mean by toxic is that I totally lost myself in this relationship. Couldn't even remember, no joke, what my favorite color was. Didn't know. Because I just gave myself to this relationship in such a way that I lost a sense of self and I began to get that back but I had this fear in me and I had this pushing and driving concern that people who were around me were going to turn me into something that I didn't want to be. That I was going to forget my favorite color again and not know who I was anymore and I had this 
fear and insecurity that was pushing me. God had to whisper to my heart and say, that's not reality, son. You need to get healing from that. You need to let me heal that area of your life. What's pushing you? Take a moment and look at that second question on your card and take a moment with the Holy Spirit and answer that question as best you can. What is pushing you? Want to know what the antidote for this question is? None other than Christ's grace. Christ's grace. In Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 to 29, Jesus said this. You'll remember this. Come to me, all who are labor and are who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest. For your souls. Take a look at that in the message. They're going to put it up. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Let me tell you something. God is not a driven manager of over our lives waiting for us to produce results. And some of you may have that image of God or that image of, of Jesus in your mind that somehow he's going to push and prod you along by force. Most of the time he says, come follow me. And he's not pushing us by force, although from time to time he will give us a gentle nudge. But he says here, come to me and learn the unforced rhythms of grace. The antidote is Christ's grace because God wants us to be free from thinking that we are going to be pushed along, whether by our own self-will or by him in some taskmaster kind of way. And some of us need to sort of, by faith, by faith, reimagine what our life can look like and begin to envision something different where we're not living by impulse, where we're not living being pushed from one thing to the next by like violent force because we're anxious or we're stressed out or we're afraid or we're in doubt. God doesn't want any of that stuff to be pushing our life from moment to moment. He wants us to settle in to the unforced rhythms of grace and let us just kind of walk along with him. And if you can re-envision that for your life, what would your life look like? How would your conversations be different? How would your decision-making be different? How would your demeanor be different? How much might your physical health be better if we learn together the unforced rhythms of Christ's grace? The third question is this. What's filling you? What's filling you? What is constantly occupying your mind, heart, and soul? What is a constant distraction in your day-to-day thinking or feeling? What's filling you? The question is not what has filled you, although that might be a good question to ask. The question is what is on an ongoing basis filling you like you would pour water into a cup because something is filling you, and often we have a choice in regards to what is constantly filling us up. We have a choice. The question is, are we making the right choices about what's filling us up? So if we're studying the news and current events and every trending story that's predicting a dismal future, then all of a sudden what's filling us up is fear. Remember Y2K? I feel so old talking about Y2K. That was almost 20 years ago, people. Remember Y2K? Some of, some of you younger people are like, what in the world is he talking about? So at the turn of the century in 1999, there, I can't even fully explain it because it was so nuts. <laughs> there, 
It was. They had this idea. They, they, they were worried. Everyone was worried that computer, everything that was computer-driven, machine-driven, uh, was just going to shut down at the stroke of midnight when, when we went from 1999 to 2000 because the computers couldn't compute the number 2000. I'm probably not even explaining this right. <laughs> but that's pretty much what it was. And I worked at a grocery store at the time. People were coming in, filling up three or four grocery carts full of food because the apocalypse was about to, I'm not, it's funny. And I was laughing as a teenage kid working in the grocery store, but this is what people were doing all because the media was just pushing this on us. Be very afraid. And that was filling up people's souls and minds. And they were spending thousands of dollars on frozen food and canned goods and water. And just, it was nuts. And then the stroke of midnight came. Nothing happened. <laughs> Y2K came and went. And those people had like, you know, frozen chicken dinners for days. Like, oh my goodness. <laughs> what is filling us? Maybe you're in a relationship that's just negative and toxic. And every time you're with this person, you just feel like they're filling me up with negativity. There have been moments in my life where God has shown me you cannot have this relationship anymore because it's filling you up with something other than what I desire to fill you up with. What is filling us is not always external. It could just be our own internal longings of lust or desire for money and power that we're rehearsing over and over again. And that's filling up our minds and our souls and occupying our thinking constantly. And Paul says to test ourselves, and a good question to get really honest about is what is filling you? Take out the card. Take a moment. Try to answer that question. What is filling you? Go for it. The antidote for this question or the problem that this question poses is Christ's spirit. Christ's spirit. In John 14, <clears throat> 16 to 18, well actually before John 14, 16 to 18, I wanted to make mention that before Christ left the earth, as he was getting ready to leave and explain this to his disciples, he told them at one point that him leaving was going to be an advantage to them. And they were boggled by him saying that. What do you mean? How is it? You can't leave. You're the Savior. How is that going to be an advantage? And he, he goes on to explain what he meant by that. And in John 14, 16 to 18, Jesus says this, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it, is neither, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. And then he says this, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Jesus says, it's good that I'm leaving and I'm not going to leave you like orphans. And the connotation there is that Orphans would have represented the idea that there, there's a powerlessness there, a weakness there, a defenselessness there. And Jesus is essentially saying, I'm not going to leave you powerless. I'm not going to leave you defenseless. I'm not going to leave you weak because I'm sending my spirit who will be with you and will be in you. And the Apostle Paul, the same one who wrote to the Corinthians, also wrote to the Ephesian church. And he said in Ephesians 5 and verse 18, And do not be drunk with wine, that is, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit, Paul says, because he knows we're inevitably going to be filled with something. 
So be filled with the Spirit. You know, our faith is not just a cognitive, intellectual faith. It's an experiential, supernatural, actual, be actually being able to sense and know the presence of God in a real way because of the Holy Spirit, friend. I, I, I can remember as clear as day when I was 16 years old, I got filled with the Holy Spirit. I began to pray in other tongues, and I was in an atmosphere of worship, and it absolutely changed my world internally and externally. And God showed me, and I began to realize that I had never really been filled in the way that God was filling me and wanted to continue to fill me over and over and over again. Jesus told the woman at the well, who said, give me a drink. You remember this? And Jesus says, the water that I have to give, you will never be thirsty again. Because the well that is our God never runs dry. And the, the Holy Spirit is constantly hovering and waiting in our lives to fill us up over and over and over again. But we've got to expect it. We've got to ask for it. We've got to desire it. And know that the, that the antidote for the, for the problem that the question poses of what is filling us, the antidote is the Holy Spirit, friend, seeking after Him. If we walk in the Spirit, we will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. If we walk in the Spirit, Paul said that to the Galatian church, then we will not fulfill our selfish desires. There's something to this ongoing filling of the Holy Spirit, friend. We need to pursue it on a daily basis, on a regular basis. The fourth and final question is this. What's shaping you? And we've got to sort of wrestle this one to the ground. What's shaping you? What has its hands on you to turn you into something? Right? What is shaping you. We are inevitably shaped by something. It's not a question of whether or not we are being shaped. It's a question of who or what is shaping us. You're becoming someone, good or bad. You're becoming someone every day. What is shaping you? In the garden in Genesis chapter 3, the shaping of mankind begin to happen, and it happened by the serpent bringing an idea to mankind. In Genesis chapter 3, you don't have to turn there. It says in verse 1, Now the serpent, now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you should not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you, sh you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The serpent brought an idea to Eve and the idea was God is being withholding. God doesn't want good things for you. He knows that if you eat the fruit, Eve, you're going to become like him. The irony was, is that they were already created in his image. It was such a lie. And, but, but the serpent brings this idea to Eve. God's withholding from you. And Eve buys it. And in that moment, it's an idea that comes to Eve, puts its claws on her, and begins to shape her in that moment begins to mold her in that moment. And of course, we're told in Isaiah 64 and 8, but now, O Lord, you are our father. We are the clay and you are the potter and we are the work of your hand. We've got to let our lives be soft and pliable in the hands of the real potter, the fa our father God, who wants to shape our lives, get his hands on our lives. Paul says, test your faith. Test yourselves. Prove yourselves. And part of that is asking the question, what is shaping us? Or what ideas have crept into our minds and hearts to shape us into something? Take a moment, pull the card out, and answer the fourth question. 
on the card. The antidote for this question is Christ's voice. Christ's voice. We need to let Christ's voice be the loudest voice in our lives, friends. Let his ideas about our life trump every other idea that comes along. In Colossians chapter 2, Paul says of Christ that in him, in verse 3, are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And he says in verse 4, and I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. Paul says, look, in Christ is everything that anyone needs to know about anything. And I'm saying this to you, Paul says, so that if anybody comes along with what seems like a logical argument, a logical idea that goes against what Christ would have you do, just know that they don't know anything compared to Christ. Just know that he has the final authority. Just know that the one who created the heavens and the earth, when he has something to say about our life, about our world, about who God is, that he's the final authority. And it's not that we can eliminate other voices in our life. It's that we can put the most authority, the most weight on the voice of Jesus Christ. His voice is the antidote. When we became a Christian, we became a disciple which means student or apprentice of Christ, not anyone or anything else. We're disciples of Christ. C.S. Lewis says this, the church exists for nothing else but to draw men into Christ, to make them little Christ. And if they are not doing that, all the cathedrals, clergy, missions, sermons, even the Bible itself are simply a waste of time. Will you stand with me? Are we letting Christ, his ideas about God, about life, about the world shape us over and above any other idea? We're going to worship now for a couple of minutes. And what I'd like us to do as we worship is I want you to get a little bit introspective and think about the questions that we've been walking through in this little self-test. How did you answer them? How might God continue to speak to you about them? How might the Holy Spirit want to say something else to you about what's holding you, what's keeping your life together, about what's pushing you, about what's filling you, and about what's shaping you. Let's worship and let him speak to our hearts.